Hi, this is AP US History Video 10, Geography and Regional Development in British North America, the Development of Self-Government. This is John Linneval of John Linneval Tutoring, www.johnlinevaltutoring.com. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you like this video. The Evolution of Self-Governance. By the 1700s, British North American colonies had developed remarkably democratic institutions, especially by that time standards. Early attempts at representative democracy such as these came about because the government developed in a near power vacuum. There was no extensive government system established by Great Britain and North America, even though the British did do that in India. So the British supervision of American colonies was minimal, even considering the fact that Britain was far from the Americas. For whatever reason, they didn't establish as extensive a government system or supervise as closely as they could have in the Americas. The evolution of self-governance continued. All 13 colonies became royal colonies eventually, whether they were founded by a joint stock company or a proprietor. Royal colonies were ruled by the crown, that is the king or queen, whoever was in power at that time. So all the legislatures handled local matters, but they didn't handle matters that affected the empire or things really that were outside their boundaries. Makes sense. The United States can't pass laws governing other countries, things like that, etc. So it's the same thing here. Virginia could pass a law that taxed the colonists to develop ports or something like that, but they couldn't say, okay, well, the crown is going to pay so much for tobacco from Virginia or blah, blah, blah. Doesn't work that way. So colonial taxes could be raised by the legislature to run the colony, like build internal improvements such as roads. And the legislatures had the power of the purse. By purse, they mean more like a wallet, not, not a handbag. You know. Anyway, something where you keep your money, which kept the appointed colonial governors in line and made the colonists feel as though they were self-governing. So here we have a modern day US legislator, Paul Ryan saying, my budget just going to pump you up. If you remember the old Hans and Franz sketches from Saturday Night Live, which if you're a high school student, those were before you were born, but look them up. Hans and Franz, parody of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Via here to pump you up. Anyway, the power of the purse can be used by a legislature to either pump the executive branch, the governor up, and help him or her ex execute whatever he or she is going to do. But a no from the legislature sometimes is not as bad as you might think. Sometimes they're saying, yes, we agree, you should do this, governor, but no, this isn't the way to do it. So why don't you find a better way to do this and we'll approve it if you can find a better way to achieve the same goal. All right, let's move on. As we said before, all 13 colonies had legislatures. All the colonies' legislatures were bicameral, that is, they had two houses or two chambers. Camera means chamber. And so when you have a camera that you take pictures with, that's because there's an inside a little box that you know, where an image appears through a hole. But anyway, they imitate the British Parliament, except for Pennsylvania, which had only one house. So as previously stated, while colonial governors were appointed by the king or the proprietor, they had to depend on the legislature for money, the power of the purse. And since the lower houses were elected by white male property owners, those people believed that they had power over government because after all, they were electing at least part of the legislature. The upper houses were usually appointed, they were advisors to the governor, and they had some judicial, that is judge-like powers and legislative powers. So they could do some things that judges normally do. And they also served as legislators, of course, because that's what legislators do. New England town meetings. New England town meetings were in-person assemblies where all free male residents of a town could participate in making decisions for the town. These meetings were usually held once a year and involved the choosing of select men. Get it? Select when you choose somebody. Men. You know, men. So they would govern the town until the next meeting. This was a form of direct democracy, in-person voting, and also representative, since these select men were representatives. So that'd be representative government. They still have selectmen in New England towns to these days. This is a picture of a modern day New England town meeting. I attended college in Massachusetts. They have selectmen. Other parts of the country, you might call them city council people or representatives of some sort, aldermen. Here, they are called selectmen 
One of my classmates actually ran for selectman. He didn't win, but there was a little article written about him. Student selectman, blah, 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 blah. I think he didn't win. Maybe he did. I don't know. Pretty sure he didn't. Anyway, not important right now. New England towns, town meetings were a great example of direct and representative democracy in colonial America. Virginia's House of Burgesses. The House of Burgesses was created by the Virginia Company in 1619. That was 12 years after the company founded Virginia, the colony itself, in 1607 for profit. The idea was, of course, that by 1619, the Virginia Company realized that they actually needed some kind of government in the Virginia colony. The House of Burgesses was a representative assembly. All free men could vote at first, then rights were limited to wealthy men. The king made the Virginia Company turn the colony over to him in 1624 after receiving too many complaints and just getting tired of hearing it. The king allowed the House of Burgesses to continue, but not officially. There wasn't really anything in writing, but it did become more exclusive, that is, non-wealthy planters were excluded and less powerful, after King Charles actually did officially sanction the House of Burgesses when he asked in writing that the House of Burgesses assist with tobacco regulation. Okay, by asked, I mean ordered. But anyway, he asked the House of Burgesses to assist with tobacco regulation, so that was the first post-1624 official sanction or permission or demand that the House of Burgesses exist and do something concerning legislation. Before 1624, the House of Burgesses did actually have more explicit power to govern the colony, was the official legislation. Not legislation, that would be the laws, legislature. Anyway, it was the official legislature. And if you want to look this up yourself, you can go to www.encyclopediavirginia.org forward slash House of Burgesses, House underscore of underscore Burgesses. In case you're wondering what this thing is called, now you know it's called an underscore. All right, let's move on. The House of Burgesses was created by the Virginia Company in 1619. The company founded Virginia in 1607 for profit because Virginia, the colony, needed some kind of government so the Virginia Company could make a profit from it. The representative assembly was the House of Burgesses, as I just said, and all free men could vote at first, then the rights were limited to wealthy men. If you're wondering why they had these kinds of restrictions, the idea of traditionally in English culture was that the only people who should be able to vote would be respectable members of society who had a significant stake in society. So usually it was limited to something like landowners in Virginia. A lot of times it changes back and forth if you look at the encyclopedia virginia.org website from landowners and or heads of household to only wealthy landowners to landowners and wealthy or whatever important tenant farmers who didn't own the land but they were tenants on the land but they were still important so basically the idea was they only wanted people who actually had a significant stake in society so they didn't want people who were just individuals who could presumably just pack up and move to another colony very easily I'm guessing that is the rationale, and from what I read, that is the rationale is, okay, well, this person's a landowner. Of course they have a great degree of involvement in Virginia because they own actual part of Virginia's land. Anyway, so rights were then limited to wealthy men. The king basically made the Virginia Company turn the colony over to him in 1624. This is King Charles. King Charles allowed the House of Burgesses to continue, but it became more exclusive. That is, non-wealthy planters were excluded, and it also became less powerful. There was a time where the House of Burgesses was still operating without any official charter from the king because the king took over the colony but didn't abolish the house of burgesses but it didn't really have any official approval until king charles asked the house of burgesses to assist with tobacco regulation so that was the first official kind of written authorization for the house of burgesses to do anything with the king before 1624 that is before the king took over the colony 
the House of Burgesses had more explicit power to govern the colony like any other colonial legislature. So it did things like a state legislature might do in the United States state today. And if you want to go to the website and check it out yourself, it's www.encyclopediavirginia.org forward slash house underscore of underscore Burgesses. And I also have that in the description below. Early steps towards centralized government. The New England Confederation was the most prominent step towards central government up to that time. It didn't really have any real power, but it was advisory and could offer dispute resolution between different settlements and colonies, and also mutual military aid. So the different colonies would have to support each other in war, but no colony could go to war without the approval of the Confederation. So we can see... You have to have a six-eighths majority, so it would be a three-fourths majority. I guess they're not reducing fractions here. Okay, for war and levies. Well, they mean, you know, six of the eight commissioners had to approve war and levies. The president was elected by the six-eighth majority. So there were four colonial governments. So there were two per colony. So Massachusetts, Plymouth, Connecticut, and New Haven. So that's before New Haven became part of Connecticut, etc. So... Anyway, that's what happened there. Reminds me very much of this Monty Python scene. All right. Did you find this video useful? Please like it and subscribe to my channel. Neither action costs you anything. You'll be alerted about my new videos. Why do I care? Well, it's simple. YouTube won't let me share any ad revenue unless I have 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 hours of view time in a year. Don't have 4,000 hours of watch time at this time. Still don't have a thousand subscribers, though I keep getting closer. For the same reasons, you're not only welcome, but encouraged to share links to this video, put it in playlists, etc. I'm always happy to read and respond to constructive criticism or suggestions for new videos. I'd appreciate your input. I reserve the right to delete comments from and block those who specialize in destructive criticism. You know, those trolls you keep hearing about or things that are off topic, spammers, disturb people, just people who wanna post things that really don't have anything to do with this video. You can also hire me for tutoring. Thanks for watching. And here's how to contact me if you wanna contact me. This phone number here is my cell phone, so if you would like to text me, go for it. You can email me, john at johnlinneball.com. Here's my Facebook, here's my Instagram. I have a testpreparation.locals.com site, so on locals.com. And if you would like to send me postal mail, you can send it here, John Linball Tutoring, 1859 Powell Street, number 109, San Francisco, California, 94133. And finally, just note, this is not a substitute for your classes, your text, etc. This video is based on the Barron's AP United States History Review book. Also, the Princeton Review, U.S. History, AP Review book from you know, 2019 edition. And my general knowledge of U.S. History, also any websites that I've already referred you to. While this should help you do well on the AP U.S. History exam, I cannot be responsible for what your teacher thinks is important and asks you about in his or her own tests, homework, etc. Please read your class text and pay attention to what your teacher says in class. All right. Have a good day. Thanks.